Hey, JP here. These are our latest firing tests. We are entering a whole new phase in our magnetohydrodynamic research. This is all part of our plasma rocket engine development program. Now, all of our tests so far have been pulling electrical power out of the system. This lets us really refine things like the electrode position, shape and composition, the channel dimensions, and the magnet configuration. We've done 129 test firings in the power out configuration. Now, we're switching it around and we're pumping electrical power into the engine for greater thrust. Today, we're looking at magnetohydrodynamic test firing number 130 and 131, our first two power end tests. First, we'll go over the 30 volt firing, and second, the 42,000 volt firing. And then after all that flame and noise, I'll show you what's coming up next. The MHD unit is only one part of the plasma engine we're developing. That engine we're going to run in two modes. One, during the long low thrust requirement, we're actually pulling power out for the drag reduction systems. The second mode, we're pumping power in for higher thrust. This is needed for the last orbital insertion part of the flight path. You know, the big picture of the program is develop power out, develop power in, integrate it with the rest of the engine, and then start scaling up. These firings are very different from the engine tests we've done so far, which means we're gonna mess it up. These first tests in this configuration are really shakedown runs. You know, it took us 30 runs in the power in configuration just to get the unit working. You know, whenever we make big leaps in the research, the first pilot tests never result in any data. They only show us everything that could possibly go wrong. And with any luck, they show us how to make it go right. So in one sense, these first few stumbling tests are the most important. In these tests, we interact magnetically with the plasma of the rocket engine's exhaust. How well we interact with it is what we're trying to find out. Now, these are pretty simple tests, but there are a lot of parts, and doing it takes a lot of steps. You don't stand a chance of pulling it off without a checklist. This is the one for this test. And that's just the firing. There is a whole second page that you need to do to turn it off safely with the data intact. This is our test rig on our little red wagon rocket engine test stand. NASA, eat your heart out. It all looks pretty small, and it is. Big comes later after we've sorted out all the small stuff. MHD-130 was the first test. It was low voltage and moderate amperage. The power supply pumps out 30 volts at 30 amps. The magnetic field strength between the four neodymium magnets is 0.635 Teslas. We're measuring thrust with a load cell and using an Arduino microcontroller as a data logger. Okay, now, on to the test. one was a bit of a handful. We had to swap a motor in the middle of it all 
And in spite of three dry runs, the order of the tasks on the checklist needed to be rearranged quite a bit during the live firing. We discovered that the low sample rate on our data logger of 20 samples per second for the load cell was just not enough. It looks like the peak event happened between two data points. Our regular data logger does 10,000 samples per second, but it's not compatible with the load cells. We didn't see any increase in the current going to the electrodes. That means we had a very minimal interaction with the plasma in the channel. It took us over 30 hot firing tests to get the power outside working, so I'm not too worried about the problems. In fact, finding out the problems is the real purpose of the initial tests. As far as shakedown goes, it was an excellent first run. Now we're going to up our game with the power in test number two. But first, you know how YouTube works. It's the subscribers that make it happen. If you're already one, a big shout out and a thank you. If you're not yet a subscriber, it's time to hit that subscribe button. It really helps keep the program going and it lets us make more videos to let you know how it's all going. Okay, now for real, on to the test. For test firing 131, we're upping the voltage from 30 volts to 42,000 volts. One bit of data we got from the firing 130 was that the 30 volts just wasn't enough to connect with the plasma. It certainly will be later when we add our water potassium seeding like we did in the power out tests. Then it's a fairly simple process. However, we're not ready for that yet on the power in. The next best thing to make sure that the electrodes talk to the plasma is to increase the current a lot. To step up the voltage, we're gonna use a coil and we just happen to have one. The ignition system for our paraffin potassium MHD rocket motor blocks use a coil. It's from a 1968 Volkswagen Bug ignition system. To that, we've added a tank circuit to drive it. Here is the system in draft mode on the bench. Here it is in action, igniting a paraffin potassium motor block. However, instead of 12 volts, like the bug or in our rocket engine ignition system, we're gonna put 30 volts in to get a bit more bang out of it. The coil puts out about 28,000 volts when it's in the Volkswagen bug to drive the spark plugs. But what is it putting out when we feed it 30 volts at up to 30 amps? A gap test is an easy way to measure the approximate output of the coil. You can calculate how much voltage it takes for a spark to jump a gap. The equation takes in many factors, but you can simplify it by running it at sea level pressure, room temperature, and at a narrow electrode face. You end up with it taking about 30 volts per centimeter to ionize the air and jump the gap. This setup is showing the gap at three centimeters which takes 90,000 volts to cross. This is using a bigger coil that we're going to use on future tests. The VW coil was solidly sparking across a 1.4 centimeter gap. That puts it at about 42,000 volts. This is what the arcing looks like in an MHD channel in a strong magnetic field. You can see the electric arcs forming around curving around the magnetic field lines. With the upper magnet off, so we can see inside, this is about half the magnetic field strength that we normally run. You know, when the motor is running, there is a solid wall of plasma inside this channel. So there's no gap to jump. This increases the current. However, that plasma is also at a significantly higher temperature and pressure and that inhibits the flow of current. Balancing and optimizing the current to plasma to magnetic field strength 
is a big part of what these tests are trying to work out. The next thing we needed to do for test 131 was increase the sample rate of the data logger. We've rewritten the code about 16 times. We've now upped the data rate from 20 to 500 samples per second. That should be enough at this stage. Here is the little red wagon config for test 131. You know, it takes about two hours to set up and run through the checklist to get this thing going. But let's cut straight to the firing. Success. I consider a test a success if we did it safely, meaning nobody got hurt. High voltage and rockets combined with a complex process can easily get out of hand. This one took a three person team to pull off and they were great. You can't have enough cameras pointed at your test. This is to see everything about the test itself, but also to catch your process to see if you did anything wrong. We ran four cameras, but one came out blurry. We can see from the increased current during the firing that we did interact with the plasma. And that's a real good start for this phase. The data logger failed. The file didn't close. So we didn't get any thrust data. After the firing, we tested it six waves from Sunday and we can't replicate the failure. This suggests that the problem may be in the greater complete system, such as we may have gotten a high current line too close to a data line. We have pretty minimal shielding, so a little more may be in order. Opening it up, we discovered that we completely blew away one of the electrodes. The other one was completely undamaged. I think we had an alignment shift after ignition, directing everything at the lead electrode. All this means more testing before we can do more testing. But that's how development works. I'm actually pretty happy with the progress from these two tests. They really shook out the system and showed us exactly what we need to work on. What's next? Well, first off, a repeat of MHD 131 with the data logger and the electrode problem fixed. Then we'll start testing using our new more powerful coil at the 90,000 volt and above voltage range. We also want to experiment with a two-stage electrode configuration. We've already started getting rolling on our RF pre-ionization enhancement experiments. Say that three times fast. We're also already working on mounting the whole thing on a small sounding rocket. We've learned from our high altitude program that it's never too early to build flight hardware and learn from that. This is what that'll look like. I want to thank our Patreon supporters who keep us flying. If you're interested, you can check us out over at patreon.com slash JP Aerospace. There is a link in the description below. Well, the only thing left is on to test 132. Thank you for watching. JP Aerospace, America's other space program.